Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. So we have talked a number of times on the show about how we collect and manage our topic lists. Uh, And there are times I know for me when I come across something in the wild and I just scribble it down and then I don't have any idea what that was about. (laughs) Right. Uh, And I think you mentioned a similar thing happening recently, Tracy. I did. So a few days back, I was reviewing a notebook that I had recently been using to keep my to-do lists and my schedules in because I kind of do... I'm reticent to call it a bullet journal. It's really just like my weird, if Faulkner kept a bullet journal kind of stream of consciousness of like all my to-do stuff. So it's at least in one place for the important things. Um, And then I go back and I review them and make sure I've captured anything that needs to get carried over into the next one. And I'm a little slow to do it with my transfer from one to the next this time. But I was looking over this last book and in a, literally in a margin sideways, I had just written the word Ciceretta and I didn't know what it was. (laughs) and I couldn't remember where it came from. Uh, So I looked it up and I sure am glad I did. Uh, Because it turns out that at some point in the last several months, I had apparently stumbled across Ciceretta Jones, who was a Black operatic and popular music singer in the early 20th century. And she was very famous in her day, but then she kind of vanished from the papers and all press coverage when she retired. And her last years were lived in relative obscurity, which meant that when she died, nobody really knew very much about it, and it didn't get a lot of coverage. And she really hadn't been... Uh, as as celebrated throughout history as she certainly deserves. So she is due for a little bit of attention, and that's what we are talking about today. Matilda Ciceretta Joyner was born January 5th, 1868, in Portsmouth, Virginia. Uh, We don't have any recording or anything of how she said her own name. I've heard people say it's Ciceretta and Ciceretta. We're just going to stick with Ciceretta for the sake of consistency. The date of that also has some question marks because some records have 1869 rather than 1868 as the birth year. Ciceretta was born into a religious family. Her father, Jeremiah Malachi Joyner, who went by Jerry, had been enslaved at birth but was a free man when Ciceretta was born. He worked as a carpenter and as a minister at the African Methodist Church. Her mother, Henrietta, worked as a washerwoman and also sang in the church choir. Ciceretta went by both Matilda and Sissy with her family. Yeah, we'll talk about her name a little bit more uh, in a, in just a bit. And we should also mention, like, it's worth noting that she was born just a few years after the Civil War ended. So, like, at a time when the, the country was really going through significant change. Uh, Jerry and Henrietta had two more children in addition to Ciceretta, but both of them died when they were still young. In 1876, after the loss of Ciceretta's brother, the family moved to Providence, Rhode Island. Jerry had been offered a position at a church in Providence, and he saw this as an opportunity for a better life in this other state. Ciceretta was enrolled once they moved at Meeting Street Primary School, which was integrated, as were all Rhode Island schools, following the passing of a statute by the Rhode Island General Assembly on March 7, 1866, that had stated that, quote, no distinction be made on account of the race or color of the applicant. So it seems like at this point the joiners were really settling into a stable community that had better opportunities than they'd had back in Virginia, but things were strained at home. We don't really know the specifics of the situation, but by 1878, Ciceretta's parents were living separately and she was living with her mother. The joiners formally divorced more than a decade later in 1889. Court records indicate that Jerry had accused his wife of adultery. It's not really clear how much involvement Jerry had in Ciceretta's life after the joiners separated. But while the loss of siblings and moving and this tumultuous family life were part of her early years, there was one thing that had been consistent for just about as long as she could make noise, and that was that Ciceretta sang. She loved to sing. She would later say to a reporter, quote, "'When I was a little girl, just a wee slip of a tad, I used to go about singing.' I guess I must have been a bit of a nuisance then, for my mouth was open all the time. 
In addition to just singing on her own whenever she could, she sang at school, she sang in church, she sang at events for school and church. Everyone could hear that she had a really exceptional voice even when she was a child. She described being nervous about performing initially when she was young, but then, as she put it, quote, timidity was soon replaced by confidence. And somewhere along the line, someone talked to Henrietta about how beneficial it would be for Ciceretta to get formal training for her natural talent. There's a story that she told later in life that someone at church was like, your little girl just hit a high C. Please find her a school. <laughs> um, and so in 1883, 15 year old Ciceretta started taking lessons at the Providence Academy of Music. It is a little unclear how these lessons were paid for. Uh, Henrietta would have had a very hard time covering this cost. But the, as a consequence, there's been some speculation about whether someone from the community may have helped out with money or even perhaps people in church kind of contributed into a fund or if there was just some other arrangement at the school. But we really don't know. In addition to the start of her formal training, Ciceretta also had another major life change at 15 when she rather suddenly married a hotel porter who worked at the Narragansett Hotel. His name was David Richard Jones. Ciceretta actually lied on her marriage license. She said that she was 18 and her new husband was 21. Seven months into the marriage, the Joneses had a child. It was a daughter that they named Mabel Adelina. And Ciceretta, though, did not give up her singing lessons. Uh, David, who had worked his way up from that uh, porter position to a waiter position at the hotel, continued to work to support them. And Henrietta assisted with child care so they could make this whole thing work. And they all lived together at Henrietta's house. Not only was Ciceretta studying, she was also performing regularly at church concerts, as well as in small secular performances. Sometimes her name was listed for these as Mrs. Richard Jones. And one thing to note about names here, we've been referring to the singer as Ciceretta, but for the early part of her career, she used her first name, Matilda, as well as Mrs. Richard Jones, or Matilda S. Jones. We're using the name that she became famous for just to keep things kind of consistent, because there are a number of different ways she was billed, one of which is really famous, but also pretty gross, and we will get to that in just a bit uh, when she herself made this switch. So she appeared in 1885 at the Providence Armory Hall alongside established singer Flora Batson. And Batson really offered a glimpse of possibility to Ciceretta regarding her potential career. Flora, at this point, was breaking the color barrier and performing in front of white audiences singing classical music, and not the expected jokey and often demeaning minstrel material that had been the only avenue available for Black performers for a long time. And this also offered Ciceretta a look at the possibility of having a real career in music, at a time when a lot of Black women were really only able to find employment as domestic workers or just doing things like taking in laundry. In December of 1885, she got the chance to perform with another Black singer who similarly was expanding her career beyond what was expected, and that was Marie Salika. Salika was famous, and being billed in a concert with her was a really big deal. And eventually, the three singers, Batson, Salika, and Jones, would be constantly compared to one another in the press. But just as Ciceretta was really getting some acclaim and some name recognition, her daughter Mabel got sick. And Mabel did not recover. She died in February 1886 at the age of two, and the cause of death was listed as pharyngitis and croup. For several months, Ciceretta stopped all performing and grieved, but by late spring, she was ready to sing again. And at that point, she started to once again perform in concerts around Providence. In the fall of that year, there was more training, although the particulars around that are a little bit unclear. We know that Ciceretta traveled to Boston. According to an article from the time, it was to study at the Boston Conservatory of Music. But other write-ups that were published after the fact say that she was trained at the New England Conservatory of Music. There's really no corroborating evidence for either version of this story, though. She doesn't appear in the records of the New England Conservatory, and the Boston Conservatory's records have not survived to be checked. Yeah, so we don't know. Because it is possible that she could have studied at the New England Conservatory and just not been noted as a student, like as a, a side deal with one of the teachers. We just have no idea what happened there. 
But by the end of 1886, Jones had completed her studies in Boston, and she was back in Providence once again giving performances. She and her husband had a lot more in mind for her, though. She started appearing on regional tours, often with Flora Batson. And in 1888, she made her New York City debut in a concert with Batson at Steinway Hall. That was at a benefit for the Odd Fellows Building Fund. A lot of her early performances like this were benefits. Cicerretta was billed as the rising soprano of Providence. And the concert ended in the red because inclement weather kept people from attending. But the reviews of Jones in particular were glowing, and this led to a similar concert booking in Philadelphia soon after. So it's unclear which of these shows that talent agent William Risden saw, but he was really impressed with Cicerretta when he did see her. And this led to a contract with his agency, which was Abby Schoffel and Growl. Risen had quite a plan in mind for her. And we're going to pause here for a word from our sponsors. And when we come back, we will talk about the whirlwind tour that Ciceretta found herself on in 1888. On August 1st, 1888, Ciceretta Jones attended her first rehearsal with the Tennessee Jubilee Singers. This was an all-Black group of musicians and singers, and they were leaving the next day for a tour through the Caribbean and South America. Members of the press had been invited to hear the group perform after just a small amount of rehearsal on that same day, and once again, Ciceretta's voice captivated them. So it's from the coverage of this event that it seems like she got the nickname that stuck with her for the rest of her life. This was a nickname she really disliked and that was the Black Patty. This nickname was a reference to Italian opera singer Adelina Patti, who was really famous at the time. She's still one of the most celebrated sopranos in opera history. Jones would later tell a reporter that the reason she disliked this name was that she felt like it might make people think she was comparing herself as an equal to this famous singer. What she really wanted to do was to make her own name without using the appeal of someone else did not help that her tour manager seized on the nickname and used it to promote the tour that she had signed on for. I mentioned this to Holly before we got in here. Looking at pictures of her, so many of them are labeled as Black Patty rather than with her actual name. Oh, yeah. And he, I mean, every one of her managers used that because it was a ticket draw. We'll talk about it a little bit more. It's horrifying. The other two singers that we mentioned uh, Batson and, and Salika similarly were called other things related to Adelina Patty. I think one of them was sometimes called Creole Patty, and I don't remember the other one offhand, but it was just like a very common thing and a little bit gross because it completely demeaned these three Black women who were phenomenal talents. Um, yeah, we'll talk about that some more in a bit. So this... uh contract that Jones had signed was for two years. Keep in mind, she was only 20 at this time. She had not traveled very far, and she suddenly found herself as the star in an international tour. And on August 2nd, the day after that one day of rehearsal, she boarded the steamer Athos along with her fellow performers, her husband, and their tour manager, James R. Smith, who was white, and they all headed to their first stop in Jamaica. They stayed in Jamaica until October because they kept selling out their shows. Then they went on to Panama. Their stay there was a lot shorter than anticipated because they had low sales numbers. It was kind of the opposite experience. But by November, they were back in Jamaica. Then they moved on to Barbados. Barbados loved her so much that the governor and citizens of Bridgetown presented her with a gold medal, and this was the start of a trend. In Trinidad, she was given another medal. And when they got to Guiana, which was at the time British Guiana, they had to cancel the first performance because most of the performers were terribly seasick. They had had a rough ride uh, on the way, and they just could not make that first show. And after a rough start and weak initial turnout, which was by some attributed to racism and by others uh, just a mix-up of what was actually going on with the booking, Madam Jones, as she preferred to be called, received a third gold medal. As the tour continued, she continued to be adored by audiences right up until the group made their return to New York. That happened in February of 1889. 
They had met with such great success, and by the time she got back to the U.S., Jones had been given eight different medals as well as other gifts, but they'd also experienced a lot of racism in these travels. In some cities, that racism impacted their ticket sales. In others, they had been turned away from hotels. But this was a profitable venture, so their bosses were happy. Smith gave interviews, this was again the tour manager, where he talked about a planned tour for Europe. But then everything changed when he abruptly sold the rights to the Tennessee Jubilee Singers concerts to a man named George M. Dusenberry. And the reason for this sudden split was accounted for very differently by the parties involved. Smith said that the performers had become combative with him and that they refused to give him any credit in their success. Several of the performers, when they were asked questions about it, told a very different story, saying that Smith was not paying for all of their expenses, as had been stipulated in their contract. And that turned out to be the truth. They had paperwork to back that up. And when the dust all settled, their contract was canceled and the performers all went their separate ways. I feel like this is a dispute that we would see happen now. It plays out over and over throughout Ciceretta's career with various troops, but also, yes, it continues to be like a career in the arts <laughs> often involves issues with business dealings. Yeah. After appearing in a number of concerts back in Providence, Ciceretta started a new tour. She was reunited with one of the singers from the Tennessee Jubilee group. That was Lewis Brown. They started a new tour, this time with a Black manager named Benjamin Lightfoot. The itinerary took them through Virginia, Maryland, Washington, D.C., Delaware, and Connecticut. This time their name was Cauty Star Concert Company. Lewis Brown did not complete the tour, though, and was replaced. And Jones's husband, David, added two dates at the end in Baltimore. They wrapped up this tour at the end of June 1889. Yeah, they were definitely reaching a point where her life was kind of like one tour after another. And they had a false start for an autumn 1889 tour of the West Indies that would have been managed by Florence Williams, who had worked as a reporter for the New York Age. Uh, So Ciceretta continued to sing instead throughout the U.S. Northeast on bookings that had been arranged by her husband, David. But in the spring of 1890, those contract disputes that had ended the fall plans were revisited, and soon Williams and the Joneses were able to come to an agreement. Under the name the New York Star Concert Company, they left for Jamaica in March, although the name changed to the Star Tennessee Jubilee Singers on the way to their first destination. Williams was able to write up the tour as it went for publication in the New York Age, And this tour was a great success. Audiences had remembered Ciceretta. They were eagerly anticipating her return. By the time they got back to New York in July of 1891, Ciceretta had been applauded by heads of state and given more lavish gifts than on her first Caribbean and South American tour. And because of the press that had been picking up those New York age stories and then publishing them again in other places throughout that tour that was going home. So when she got home, Jones actually had even more buzz than when she left. She gave concerts in New York, Brooklyn, and Philadelphia when she returned, often selling out. And in the case of an October 8th, 1891 show that took place in Brooklyn, they had to add seats to the aisles to accommodate the oversold crowds. And it turned out that some attendees just had to stand for the entire show because there was just nowhere left to sit. This is also when she switched over to using her middle name, Ciceretta, instead of going by Matilda. And this was a name that she just thought sounded more musical. Yeah, not not any other Ciceretta's going around. So it, it also just made her stand out. And this also marks the period where she received her first invitation to perform at the White House. On February 24th of 1892, she sang at a lunchtime concert there for President Harrison and his guests. Although how she was invited and how this whole thing came to be was completely unknown. Any correspondence about this request has been lost. And she is also said to have sung for three other presidents, but similarly, details on those appearances and how they were arranged has also been lost. She did decide that she would wear all those medals that she had been gifted on tour while she sang. They were pinned onto her bodice. And this would become a really iconic look for the singer. Her appearances in D.C., both for the White House and for general audiences, also got a lot of press coverage. 
A lot of this coverage, though, is pretty problematic because it praises her, but it's also inherently racist, kind of summing it up to this idea of she's Black, but she's also pretty and very talented. Yeah, it's a reading those is a little stomach churning because it is sort of like, in spite of the fact that she is this, she's also this, so we're fine with it. It's really also in that tone that's very pat yourself on the back for accepting someone else. It's a yeah. gross, gross tone. Uh, but the outcome of this ongoing rise in recognition that Jones was getting was a very major booking. She was given top billing at the 1892 Grand African Jubilee at Madison Square Garden. This was a three-day event at the end of April of that year. And when Ciceretta took the stage, that meant that she was appearing before a mixed-race audience. An estimated 3,700 of the 5,000 audience members that were present were white. She wore a pale gray gown. She had all of her medals once again pinned onto her bodice. And she opened her performance with a selection from the opera Robert le Diable, which was one of the first of the Paris opera's grand operas. She also sang Suwannee River and an assortment of other songs. And when she finished, the crowd gave her a standing ovation. She returned to the stage later in the evening with a selection from La Triviata and once again had the delight of the audience. And after the show, she was asked to give an interview in her dressing room for the New York Herald, which she did. Uh, And the next day, while some performances of the Jubilee got mixed or even bad reviews, Ciceretta's singing was praised universally. The write-up in the New York Dramatic Mirror read that the evening, quote, would be worthy of little note were it not that it brought to the attention of New Yorkers a singer who, leaving her color altogether out of the question, has one of the most pleasing soprano voices ever heard in this city. Another write-up stated that, and I love this, the soul of a nightingale seems to have lodged in that throat. This reminds me of the way that people talk about um, Jenny Lind. Mm-hmm. Although Jenny Lind is... A- way more famous name today, probably because of racism. Um, But, like, a similar focus on, like, what a a beautiful nightingale-like voice she had. So this Madison Square Garden performance is the moment in Ciceretta Jones's career that really marks a shift. It had a very significant before and after this moment. She later said, quote, I woke up famous after singing at the garden and didn't know it. Ciceretta's voice was undeniably spectacular. We unfortunately do not have any recordings of it, and I wish we did, because the way people talk about it is rhapsodic. And the thing is, everybody kind of recognized that she would have been able to handle operatic roles, which is something that she wanted to do. And there were even rumors that she was being considered for roles at the Met and with other companies, But opera companies at this point were not going to hire Black singers, even for roles that were actually written as Black characters. And aside from the racism in casting, there was this other problem, which is that there were plenty of other performers that were already established who had made clear that they would not ever appear on the stage with a Black opera singer. She sang in numerous concerts after that night at the Garden, but it was two months later that promoter Major James B. Pond reached out to her about managing her career. She agreed, and soon she was on a one-year contract with him. Pond was a really big deal. His agency handled people like Mark Twain and Charles Dickens on their tours, so this really seemed like a step up. In June of 1892, Jones sang in the lower-level venue at Carnegie Hall for a benefit concert, not the main stage. This appearance happened very, very shortly after she signed her contract with Pond, and it seems most likely that it had been booked before he was managing her performance schedule. Pond booked a group of white European musicians for Ciceretta to perform with. This was the first time that she had not been part of an all-Black group of performers, and he kept them all really busy. This also marked a shift from performing for primarily Black audiences to primarily white crowds. She noted to a reporter when asked about the shifting demographic of her ticket buyers, quote, "'I do not feel as much at home with them yet,' I'm a little shy lest they should not like me, but so far they have proved most kind. 
Pond famously booked Cicerretta at the Pittsburgh Exposition in September of 1892. This was a week-long booking, and she gave concerts for thousands of people each day, usually doing one in the afternoon and one in the evening. And on her final night at the expo booking, the venue was so packed and so stifling as a consequence that several people are said to have fainted. And when it was over, she was applauded for a full five minutes. The expo continued after that first week, and Jones went on to perform in other East Coast venues. Then the expo manager begged Pond to book her for another week there at the expo, and this was really no small ask. As part of the terms of the second week of expo appearances, the expo manager had to buy out all the other appearances that she had been scheduled for that week. But she was a big enough draw that it was worth it, so they did exactly that. She's said to have commanded a $2,000 fee for the week, which was enormous for the time, and particularly so for a Black performer. At the start of 1893, Ciceretta was booked at the Central Music Hall in Chicago, and she was still being promoted as Black Patty during this time and for the rest of her career, and she still disliked it, but it did help draw crowds, although a critic noted in Chicago that the name kind of had a negative impact on the audience's impression of her work. Like, he just felt like it set up this weird framing of it that was unnecessary. But regardless of whether ticket buyers merely went out of curiosity and draw of that name or because they knew about her and knew she was a gifted singer, she continued to win audiences over with her beautiful voice and incredibly expressive performance, moving from operatic pieces to popular songs and back. Although in Chicago, she did get a handful of harsher critiques than she was usually accustomed to. That same year, in 1893, Jones sang on the main stage at Carnegie Hall as part of a fundraiser for a project helmed by composer Will Marion Cook. Cook was attempting to stage an all-Black opera titled Scenes from Uncle Tom's Cabin at the upcoming World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago. Yeah, she agreed to be part of that opera. She also agreed to be part of this fundraiser. Like, her name being attached to it was really helping it get support. Uh, But then during a performance in Louisville, Kentucky that year, she encountered this very strange setup of segregated seating that really bothered her enough that she mentioned it in an interview while she was in the city. The orchestra seating at this particular venue was reserved exclusively for white patrons, and the gallery was for black patrons. But because this particular concert had not drawn much of a white audience, she sang to a hall that was half empty at her level while the gallery above was full, and the Black attendees were not allowed to move down to the empty orchestra seats. And she was quoted as saying, I have never met with anything like it before. I think people of my race ought not to be shut out that way. On April 25th, 1893, her manager, Pond, filed a motion to prevent Jones from appearing in concert unless he had arranged it. This happened because she and David had technically broken their contract by booking a couple of side gigs. But as this case unfolded, it turned into this ugly back and forth between the Joneses and Pond, including sworn affidavits that Pond's own boss had told them the terms of their contract couldn't be fulfilled by the company. This case dragged out into the summer with first a ruling in favor of the Joneses and then a second ruling in favor of Pond, So, though this strained the relationship, Soretta sang only when Pond arranged for it. And then in exchange, he had to pay her $150 a week. Since the country was entering a financial depression, the case could be made that this outcome was kind of favorable to the singer, at least just in strict financial terms. Yeah, it it offered some stability at a time when bookings were not necessarily going to be as consistent because the people just couldn't afford tickets to go to shows. So uh, going back to that all-Black opera, when the World's Columbian Exposition was supposed to see the premiere of scenes from Uncle Tom's Cabin, Ciceretta was not at the expo. Neither were many of the other prominent Black performers or speakers. Uh, As the date had approached, which had been named Colored Folks Day by Expo officials who wanted to turn the premiere into a bigger-themed event, 
criticisms over how the Expo had handled the entire thing and its prejudiced treatment of Black participants and attendees led a lot of the promised speakers and performers to cancel. The opera did not happen. And in fact, Ciceretta was booked for another show in New York. And although there had been advance notice of her cancellation, a crowd still came to see her. And a huge, confused, and largely concocted set of stories emerged about why she wasn't there. She did sing at that expo, although not for another month. And she did manage to pack the house despite that earlier kerfuffle. So apparently audiences did not hold the whole confusion against her. So we're about to get to another new phase of Ciceretta's career where she joins a new manager and goes on an international tour. But first we can hear from the sponsors that help keep Stuff You Missed in History Class going. By mid-1894, for reasons that are unknown, the relationship between Pond and the Joneses was severed. And Ciceretta's schedule was then being managed by a man named Rudolf Volkel. And under Volkel, Ciceretta went on a tour of Europe, which is something she had wanted for a very long time. The new company that Volkel formed was called the Black Patty Concert Company, and that company staged its first performance consisting entirely of classical pieces at Carnegie Hall on November 18, 1894. So after a number of concerts in the New York area and then the surrounding states, their European tour began on February 11, 1895, as they headed to their first show in Berlin. The reviews were just wonderful. One German reviewer wrote, quote, her voice has power and fire, and the florid passages remind one of the rapid flow of a mountain brook. There was also a lot of talk about her appearance in the press, including, again, many cringe-inducing discussions of whether she should be called Black Patty because she appeared to be of mixed race in their opinion. Yeah, there was so much discussion about the shade of her skin and what that meant, and it's gross. We can talk a little bit more about it in our behind-the-scenes, but those descriptions are upsetting. Her reviews when she got to London were a little bit more critical. There were some more direct comparisons to Adelina Patty, and Jones was found lacking by some reviewers, not all. This was also the period where she started to tell the press that she did not like that nickname, Black Patty, because to her, it made her seem full of herself. After London, Jones continued to move through Europe, appearing in Paris before moving on to Monte Carlo and Milan and then going back to Germany. The entire tour had been different from her work before this and that she was billed not only with other musical acts, but with more of a vaudevillian mix of performers. She did the same when she returned to the U.S., initially appearing at Proctor's Pleasure Palace on 23rd Street in Manhattan for an extended arrangement. Yeah, so at this point, you know, you're with, like, comedians and jugglers and animal trick acts and all kinds of things. (laughs) Um, This was all going pretty well, though, but after the Plessy versus Ferguson case was decided by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1896, which, of course, upheld segregation as constitutional, it pretty quickly became more and more difficult for Black performers to book concert halls the way Ciceretta had before she left Europe, and that impacted her career considerably. So soon, Ciceretta was touring with a new company, And it's not clear who proposed the idea for this company. In some accounts, it's David Jones. In others, it's Rudolf Volkel. Regardless of who came up with the idea, though, soon Ciceretta was touring with the Black Patty Troubadours. And this offered her a regular income and some stability, although maybe not the grandeur of her previous engagements. She was making roughly $20,000 a year, and that was the most of any Black entertainer during this period. Yeah, there were definitely lots of discussions about how rich she was in the press, which the most for any Black entertainer, but there were still other entertainers making more. But because Ciceretta's voice was universally acclaimed and she had made this transition to, you know, kind of a touring comedy troupe almost more than than these, you know, very um, slightly more highbrow concert situations, 
An interviewer in 1896 asked her if she would ever consider just disguising herself as white or lighter skinned to pursue the career that she could have easily had if racism had not maintained this barrier to opera. She responded, quote, try to hide my race and deny my own people? Oh, I would never do that. I am proud of belonging to them and I would not hide what I am even for an evening. There were also questions posed to her about the possibility of playing roles in opera that had historically been white singers in roles that were written as Black, such as in Meyerbeer's L'Africain. There was some discussion that maybe that could open up an avenue for some Black performers. But she has said that she was just too busy with her touring career to make that work. And whether she was sidestepping, having a bigger conversation about race on the opera stage, we don't know, although it does kind of seem that way. She was pretty careful to avoid those questions. So this new, constantly touring phase of her career started. It was less grand than the days that had gone before, and her marriage was also landing at its last phase. There had been hints over the years that she and David might have been having some problems and that those problems might have stemmed at least in part from the ease with which their money seemed to just pass through his hands. In 1898, Ciceretta filed for divorce on the basis of drunkenness and non-support. With the Black Patty Troubadours, Jones toured for 19 years, traveling all over the U.S., also Canada and some other places, on a seemingly non-stop revolving door of bookings. And though this was a stable career, and she was, as we said, the highest paid Black performer at the time, there were also plenty of problems. For example... She and her fellow performers often could not stay in hotels. They were not given rooms. This was, of course, problematic, uh, particularly because when you're touring and you're exhausted and you just want to sleep, the last thing you need is to be told you can't. I know when we've done tours, if somebody had told me you can't have this hotel room, I would have cried. So I, I feel like singing at the level she was at is even more exhausting. So eventually... Volko arranged to have a luxury train car purchase for the company, and that essentially became their home. It was very, very large. It had, I think, uh, I had read 10 compartments, as well as two kind of common seating areas where they would all hang out together. These vaudevillian productions featured broad comedy and musical performances that often appeased audiences with acts that really played into racist stereotypes, but that was really the only way they could get continued bookings. When it was Ciceretta's time to take the stage, though, which was the last segment of the show, the tone of everything changed considerably. Even though she was the main name on the show, she did not appear until the end. And for this section, she went almost strictly with opera selections. Many of these were arias from composers like Verdi, and over time, the staging of these sections of the show grew grander and more complex, with audiences essentially getting treated to a mini-opera that included lavish costumes and beautiful sets, as well as a full supporting chorus. And this segment came to be known as the operatic kaleidoscope. There were plenty of ups and downs during those 19 years. Early on, there were ongoing legal battles with James Pond over money that he still owed the Joneses. There were disputes among the performers. At one point, there was a huge falling out between the tour managers and the stage manager, Bob Cole, who also composed music for the show. Co-stars came and went. The supporting cast shifted around. Reviews became less consistently ebullient and more mixed over time, but it was consistent work. And the Troubadours rolled out a new show for each theatrical season, and they kept drawing in crowds. And over time, the show evolved. Uh, One of the big things was that they phased out those holdout racist stereotypes from the minstrel shows of the 19th century. It had also had a name change in 1909. It became the Black Patty Musical Comedy Company. And at that point, they started staging three-act performances that featured Ciceretta acting as well as singing. Vocal remained as the manager. He was well-respected, well-liked, and had a reputation for treating the performers well and ensuring that they had whatever they needed and that they were taken care of. He also kept them booked and busy, working on the road 40 to 45 weeks a year. The 1914 to 1915 season of the show finally hit a stumbling block too large to power through. 
There had been some rumors that the company was having financial troubles. Uh, Volkel had denied those. But the thing that actually catalyzed the end was a report that several members of the cast had been drunk during a performance in Memphis. Once this news got out, other venues were unwilling to book them, and disputes over monies owed from that last show tanked the entire enterprise. Suddenly, Madame Jones, in her mid to late 40s, was without the job that had made up the bulk of her income for almost two decades. The timing, though, was sort of fortuitous. Throughout her career, and particularly as she gained success, Ciceretta had remained very close to her mother, and she was sure to help take care of her financially, just as Henrietta had taken care of her and the family after she'd gotten married as a teenager. Before and after tours, and as often as she could manage, she would travel to Providence to visit her mother. And in 1915, when this whole blow-up happened with the touring company, Ciceretta's mother was ill, and Ciceretta was kind of ready to retire so that she could take care of her. So Madame Jones gave her last performance in New York at the Lafayette Theater in the fall of 1915. And then she all but vanished from public life. She moved into the house that her mother lived in with her second husband, Daniel Crenshaw. When Henrietta died in 1925, Ciceretta stayed, and Crenshaw did as well. And then the story gets really blurry. There's just not a lot of documentation about what Jones's life was like during these years. There are some varied and contradictory accounts from various people. She may have taken work as a cook. She may have adopted children. She may have been regularly visited by a number of celebrity friends. But we really don't have anything to corroborate the memories that were shared by various people over time. We do know that Ciceretta slowly sold off her jewelry and her other valuables that she had acquired during her performing career to kind of keep herself afloat and basically finance the remainder of her life. But towards the very end, she had run out of valuables, and she actually had to have some help from the president of the local NAACP chapter, William P.H. Freeman, to meet her bills and keep things running. On June 24th, 1933, Ciceretta died at the age of 65 from cancer. It had started in her stomach and spread to her liver. She was buried at Grace Church Cemetery near her mother, and that was arranged by Mr. Freeman, although there was no headstone there until 2018 when one was crowdfunded. In 2012, a plaque was erected to mark the location of the home in Rhode Island near where Ciceretta lived, spearheaded by the Rhode Island Black Heritage Society. So in recent years, she's gotten a little bit more attention again. I'm so glad that you chose this subject because I had never, ever heard of her. Yeah, I um, like I said, I had that scribbled note and I didn't remember what it was even until I went back and looked her up again. You can't help but sort of fall in love with her. She's really uh, an interesting figure. She was, uh, we'll talk about it some more in our Friday episode, but she was so sort of quietly breaking a lot of color barriers without pointing Mm -hmm. out that she was doing it. It was almost like her approach was to be really sly about it and then just accept it as the norm, um, which is pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. It's just pretty wonderful. Um, I have a a brief listener mail, mostly because I want to congratulate this person. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, Lisa wrote us to say, I want to thank you and past hosts for all of the wonderful podcasts. I switched to a new teaching job two and a half years ago, and today, on my birthday of all days, I finished the last of the past episodes. I love how each of the hosts makes history so exciting. There's no way I can pick my favorite episode, but I love your music-related episodes. She is a music teacher, any sad royal story, and of course, Victorian or Regency-era history. Attached is a picture of her in her PhD shirt. We um, have shirts on our T Public store that say PhD and Stuff You Missed in History class. And she has earned one. I thought this was a great time since this was a music episode to uh, to give her a shout out and thank her for writing in and telling us about it. And her picture is adorable. Mm-hmm. And uh, thank her for being an educator as well. We need it. Um, and there's, there's so much that mm-hmm. says that um, music education leads to all kinds of better performance in other areas uh, of academics. So those music teachers often the unsung heroes uh if you would like to write to us you can do so at history podcast at iheartradio.com you can also find us on social media as missed in history and you can subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app at apple podcasts or wherever it is you listen (laughs) 
Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.